Welcome to Tennis Spin, where we put our spin on your tennis. Guys, number one foot problem I always hear is I got plantar fasciitis. Well, I called in my man here, Dr. Sean, the foot guy, the foot doctor. Stay tuned. <laughs> All right, guys, so we got Dr. Sean in the house. Welcome, Dr. Sean. It's a pleasure being here. Thank you for having me. So we're going to be talking about plantar fasciitis. Now, people, for some reason, got me calling it plantar. So it's really called plantar fasciitis. Uh, the technical name, yes. Okay. Yes. Well, where people get plantar from? Yeah. Like it, it's so plantar fasciitis is the problem. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what are the causes of plantar fasciitis? So um, when it comes to the, the word plantar, I mean, that's part, part of the name is correct because it's addressing the bottom of the foot or plantar surface of the foot. Um, plantar fasciitis is um, an overuse injury, basically stress to the insertion point of uh, fascia or um, tissue um, that inserts on a certain part of your heel bone known as the calcaneus. Um, particularly at one of the uh, insertion points on the heel. Um, and then you have the fasciitis aspect, which is a, an inflammation uh, of, of the tissue. Anytime you have inflammation, you're going to get pain. Mm -hmm. So uh, when it comes to plantar fasciitis, it's usually uh, an overuse or uh, overuse type injury with um, repetitive micro trauma to that area um, where it inserts, causing pain and discomfort. So basically, Typical tennis player uh, stopping and going. Mm -hmm. um, probably got some old shoes. Oh, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and overuse of that particular part of the back near the heel, mm -hmm. right? And obviously, no cushion. I mean, I, I want to emphasize old shoes, right? Are those pretty much the causes of it? You could have old shoes, incorrect shoes, um, shoes with uh, support that isn't ideal for your foot type or foot shape that could contribute to it. Um, so a couple of factors you could do to control the, those variables to help reduce pain um, is, is shoe wear. So, I mean, it's a great, great, uh, I guess, variable to bring up is the shoes. I wanna say 20 to 30% of the people out there are probably using the wrong shoes. Running shoes, could that be a factor? Absolutely, I think um, running shoes aren't necessarily designed for tennis. Tennis is a sport where you're gonna be running a lot, moving side to side, front and back. And a tennis shoe, it's, or uh, I'm sorry, a uh, training shoe or a gym shoe isn't necessarily made for that. So it's gonna be um, more flexible than let's say a more stable rigid shoe. So all that stress you're putting um, from moving is going directly to your foot as opposed to being blocked by the shoe. So if I could grab a shoe here mm -hmm. to show you kind of a, a visual example of what I'm talking about. We have this shoe, it's a very supportive, rigid shoe. And for plantar fasciitis, um, we like to go as surgeons from a more conservative uh, treatment option to surgical. So the last thing we would want to do for something like plantar fasciitis is resort to surgery because plantar fasciitis is, is something that you could treat with conservative treatment options or options that don't involve surgery. And some of the conservative treatment options that we can modify are shoe wear. So mm. um, we have uh, shoes that are going to be better for patients or players with plantar fasciitis. And that's something we call like a rigid shoe. So anytime you pick up a shoe, you want to do the twist test. So if you want to do the twist test, just grab the shoe and you try to bend it. And if it's not bending, you can see here, that means it's going to stop a lot of rotational forces and flexible forces that would go directly to your foot. So imagine if your foot was like twisting around 
um, and not being prevented with the rigid shoe, then that's going to contribute to stress on the uh, plantar fascia, which would give you uh, plantar fasciitis type pain. The next thing you want to look for a shoe that bends only one spot. So something like this is great. It's going to bend at the metatarsal phalangeal joints, mainly where your foot's supposed to bend. Let's say if it was a, a shoe that wasn't as, as rigid, it would bend like, let's say here. I mean, that's just going to, um, it's unnatural for the foot to bend that way. So it will create pain. Um, mm -hmm. And particularly it could cause pain where the plantar fascia inserts on the calcaneus or the heel. So always want a shoe that's rigid and you want it to bend in one spot. Um, shoes also have, tennis shoes are also made with a very bulky or robust heel. And that is important when it comes to plantar fasciitis because it's mainly localized in the heel. So when you walk and run, your uh, actual gait cycle or how you walk is initiated by the heel hitting the ground first. So the heel is a very important part of initiating your step. So you want to have cushioning there um, and that will prevent um, a lot of micro trauma from hitting your heel bone. Um, and then hitting uh, or causing um, micro tears in the insertion, which could lead to plantar fasciitis. I've heard a lot of people recommend like a, the stiffest or stiffer shoe possible to alleviate the problem. Is mm -hmm. that a good solution? I think so. I think for a patient or a player who comes with plantar fasciitis, I think a more stable shoe is the optimal uh, choice because you want your shoe to protect you from all the wear and tear and unnatural motions and bending that something like tennis uh, could cause when you take steps, uh, you know, to hit ground strokes, overhead serves, things like that, getting a drop shot. So you want your shoe to protect your foot. I get a stiffer shoe and mm -hmm. let's say a month later, two months later, um, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. What's the next treatment? The next thing you could adjust is the support of your foot within the shoe. So when it comes to shoes, when you buy them, they all come with their own insert. And you could always, the great thing about the shoes is you could always just take out the old insert. And then you could purchase um, an over-the-counter orthotic, which is going to be a little bit more supportive of your foot. So if you look at, you know, a standard insole of a shoe, you could see it's very flexible very kind of elastic. So this, from a cushion standpoint, it's good, but it's not gonna really protect you from torsional like forces. Um, and then also arch support's huge too. Your foot itself, um, all feet have arches. So let's say if I had a high arched foot, I mean, this isn't really gonna support my arch as well as uh, an over-the-counter type orthotic. So if I were to compare it to something like this, you have an arch that is pretty hard and solid and it's not going to twist. So this is going to help support my arch when I'm like pounding against the ground, I run or walk and whatnot. Um, so that it will also alleviate some of the stress on the arch, which would help you with the plantar fasciitis type pain. Another aspect of an over-the-counter orthotic is they have soft spots in them for your heel too. This, as you can see, has this kind of gel cushion, which is great to absorb impact. And also you have a nice deep heel cup which will support the heel from moving around too much within the shoe. I recommend with any shoe to consider an over-the-counter orthotic um, to insert and replace with the current ones. But the key is you got to take out the old one and put the new one in. You can't have them both or else that's just I've too seen much. people do that. That's too much uh, <laughs> um, area in the shoe and it will cause your foot to kind of be cramped in the shoe, which isn't the best, uh, most comfortable uh, scenario for for playing tennis. Right, and you said the heel um, lifts or the heel cushions help yeah. too. Another thing you could do for plantar fasciitis is uh, heel cushions. Heel cushions help absorb impact from your foot hitting the ground. Uh, the great thing about these is you can buy them um, at your tennis shop and they have this kind of sticky adhesive which you can actually um, apply directly to the insole. So I'll actually like to put this at the bottom of the insole right here Imagine if this was stuck there and then stick this in the shoe. Uh, one of the reasons why we like doing that is if it was on the top of the insole, uh, after a couple like wear uh, or sessions where you wear it, it can actually just kind of start ripping off um, and it could potentially cause blisters, things like that, and irritate your foot. Um, the sweat obviously can make the adhesive not stick as well. So it's good to just like stick them on the bottom of the insole and then stick this into the shoe. Got it. So what if 
a month later, this doesn't work. What's what's next? Other things that you could do for uh, plantar fasciitis, of course, are some stretches. Uh, you know that we 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 generally uh, instruct the patients to do. So part of you know getting that uh, plantar fascia ready for movement is stretching it out. Like any type of muscle, you you want to stretch it before you start using it. So you have a, a couple of stretches you could do before you play, or even before you take that first step in the morning to help uh, get that that tissue ready for uh, ambulation or, or walking. Let's move that shoe around so that, how, show us how it should be stretched. Let's say our foot was in there. Let's say this was my foot and um, I wanted to stretch it out um, before playing. I would do something that would uh, say this was a wall and this was my foot. I would actually push my uh, toe box or toe against the wall and gently press against the wall to help stretch the arch of the foot. So this is the arch of the foot, and this would allow that to gradually stretch before immediately, let's say, like take that first step, would mm -hmm. just be too much uh, action on the muscle, and then the tendon would get a lot of that stress. So you always just want to warm up your muscles per se, and the arch has a lot of muscles there. You also have that plantar fascia. Um, so you want that to kind of get warmed up before you just start running. So uh, stretching is very important to help treat plantar fasciitis as well. So you're really trying to not hit me with that shot, huh? Yes, yes. Uh, as surgeons, we always like to go from the conservative approach down to surgical. And plantar fasciitis is something that has a very high success rate of treating without surgery. So um, we always like to go from those options. And then, uh, you know, last resort would be surgery. How about that cortisone shot? Cortisone shots. Uh, those are actually... Uh, another option you can do, what you do is you inject the cortisone. It's a, it's a steroid, so it's going to help reduce the inflammation uh, in the area. And of course, the inflammation is what could be causing the pain in the, in the um, calcaneal insertion area. So, you know, you can inject a corticosteroid into that area and it will help reduce the inflammation. One of the things about corticosteroids is you can only get so many shots. Mm. And then it's, some like to say it's more of like a, a band-aid, so to speak. It's not really going to help you long term. Um, so that that would be the next step. And I have seen uh, a lot of patients uh, have uh, good uh, treatment outcomes with the shot. But I mean, you can only get a certain number of them within a, a year. And then um, obviously, you know, when, when you're injecting something like a corticosteroid, it's, it's, uh, it, it's not as easy to do, <laughs> obviously, to get access to that as something, let's say, like adjusting your inserts and, and shoe. So um, it's always best to modify what you can first before getting to that point. And then after that is surgery? Um, I mean, if the shots don't work, there's other treatment options. There's like PRP, which is taking platelets mm. and then um, creating a, 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 like you centrifuge them and that makes them more concentrated and then you inject those into the area. And that of course would create a, a better healing environment for the inflamed tissue. Of course, there's also um, arthroscopic surgery where you make tiny incisions and then you kind of cut away all the frayed areas of the, the tendinal or the tendon insertion. Um, and then there's open procedures where you make a larger incision and you address the plantar fascia that, uh, that way. Now, of course, these are all kind of last resort mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of plantar uh, fasciitis uh, patients can get optimal treatment just by conservative measures. I, I found a little bit of success taking uh, like a, a Theragun and, and putting it in the area and just kind of like letting it like do its thing. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Or is that something you would recommend? Yeah. I mean, that, that kind of falls in the category of massaging your foot, which mm -hmm. is another treatment option for plantar fasciitis. And what that would do is kind of massage the tissue a bit. Um, I, I wouldn't see an issue with that as long as it's not too hard or like mimicking, like, let's say, the ground where you're just kind of bashing against the ground. Oh, right, right. right. Um, I mean, another uh, treatment option is massaging the, the um, arch of your foot with uh, even a tennis ball or um, frozen water ball, and that kind of falls into the category of like the massages. And I think the Thera, Theragun yeah. is something that um, would, would fall into that same category. Obviously, you don't want the, the force of that. I'm not too familiar with these Theraguns, but you don't oh. want it to be too violent. Otherwise, you're kind of creating the problem. Um, oh, so see. See, so yeah. I've heard of the, the ice uh, in the water bottle thing rolling, mm -hmm. um, which I've heard of a lot of doctors tell their patients and then they in turn tell me. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but I've also heard a conflict in which you just addressed it. You don't want more trauma on your trauma, right? Right. So obviously it's like a general <laughs> pressure when you're rolling, let's say a tennis ball or the, uh, uh, water bottle that was in the freezer. Out of a hundred patients that you see, what percentage, um, basically gets to the shot and to the surgery like mm. that you could just, you know, right here. Um, usually it's more of like a, a later resort type thing with the shot. So, I mean, it's a very low percentage Whoa. actually. Oh. I, I, we have a lot of success treating plantar fasciitis with supportive sh- uh, shoe wear, custom orthotics, over the counter orthotics and heel cushions, believe it or not. Oh. So I'd say it's uh, on this uh, lower end of the, the percentages that, you know, you would have to resort to the shot. Got it. Mm-hmm. That's great. Mm-hmm. Like I, I, I've had a, question that i've always wanted to ask a foot guy and i I keep forgetting to ask um but i'll ask now so when i sleep when i sleep Mm -hmm. um for some reason when my comforter hits my foot i do this yeah i do this Mm -hmm. and then i feel like like my my plantar actually gets affected from that Mm -hmm. is it is that a cause absolutely so one of the other treatments you could do for plantar fasciitis is something called a night splint. So what, what is going on when that's happening, when the sheets hit your uh, top of your foot, you're actually plantar flexing your foot. Therefore, the tendon in your, uh, or the fascia in the arch of your foot is always kind of in a lax position. Because there's, if you think of it like a rubber band, it would be a rubber band that's not pulled tight. It's more flexy or elastic per se. So then when you take that first step in the morning, the uh, plantar fascia is in a relaxed position most of the, mm-hmm. the night, like what, what, six to eight hours of sleep we get. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And then when you take that first step in the morning, it just ima- immediately stretches. Mm-hmm. And then where it attaches, particularly on the calcaneus or heel bone, that area gets stressed the most. So what you can do is get a night splint. I don't know if they sell these over the counter. Uh, they possibly do, but it will keep your foot in a dorsiflex position. If my hand was a foot, it would keep it like this. Therefore, keeping this plantar fascia um, kind of in a position where it's ready to, to ambulate. So that is also another treatment, the night splint as well, uh, we prescribe. And that too has great success in treating um, plantar fasciitis. Speaking of which, that first step in the morning, very common pain you get, uh, that also helps identify plantar fasciitis. That first step in the morning pain is usually when you get the pain. So what we also recommend doing is just kind of like a light, you know, uh, motion to your foot with, you know, dorsiflexion, I'm sorry, dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, you know, before you even take that first step, you know, curling your toes, extending your toes, just getting the, that, that arch, uh, just ready to walk. And it only takes like, I don't know, 10, 15 seconds to do before you take that first step. So and stretch you, it out before you yeah. put your foot in the ground. Yeah. Also, um, barefoot walking in the home can also contribute to plantar fasciitis because your foot's directly hitting the ground as opposed to something like a a slip on shoe mm. per se, um, which would help create some cushioning between your foot and the ground. Um, like a house, you know, kind of slip on shoe, a slide or even Crocs are, are a great uh, treatment modalities for uh, plantar fasciitis to allow you to have some type of cushioning uh, in the house. I know a lot of people work from home now too. So um, they're, they're walking, you know, without shoes indoors. So something that will give you some padding is also another option you can do in the house. Uh, you just brought up a good point. Mm-hmm. Actually, most people say, if you have plantar, don't walk around the house or don't walk around in bare feet. Mm-hmm. That's true. I believe so, because you're, you're creating uh, an environment for your foot where it's getting that direct force from the ground and uh, there's no barrier. So the shoe itself that you would wear would get most of that impact and also support your foot. Um, so I think, you know, you're getting uh, a more of abundance of plantar fasciitis because there's uh, more people working from home. And, you know, when you're at home, you know, you generally don't need to have shoes on for the most right. part. So, you know, we always recommend something like a slip on shoe of some sort that you could wear inside uh, to help give you some uh, degree of support and cushioning. That's mm-hmm. great. Thank you for the advice. So mm-hmm. guys, before you, you know, get poked by the cortisone shot or get cut by um, some kind of surgery, right? Consider what Dr. Sean just talked about, because usually a very small number of you will get to that point. I want to thank Dr. Sean Steenberg for hanging out with me today.
and showing us the way with plantar fasciitis. Dr. Sean, where can we find you? Uh, you can always just find me online or uh, you could you know, message me on my Instagram or send me an email. I'd be more than happy to answer any questions uh, in regards to you know, some of the subjects we talked here, just overall uh, questions about podiatry. Podiatrist by trade. And hey, he can fix your feet because we all know tennis players got the ugliest feet in the world. I would know. Thank you for watching Tennis Spin, where we put our spin on your tennis. Coach Good, check yeah. this out. Swing Vision got new commercial out. Oh, check out is James Blake right. and yeah. Ronick. Oh my God, he's still playing. I mean, he's still playing. Whoa, whoa, what, dude, dude? That's damn fast. I can do it. I can do it, dude. Back in the day, I could, I could do that. I could totally do that, dude. You can do that. You can do that. Let's go, man. We can show them how it's done. Let's go, let's go. Come on, come on, let's go, dude. Let's go, let's all right, go. All right, all right, all right. 85 miles per hour. That can't be right. No, that's definitely right. That's definitely right, man. 88 miles per hour. That's not a gigawatt. One more, one more. Watch me, watch me. 78 miles per hour. Hey, man. <laughs> Something wrong with this program. Nah, that's just you, bro. L you try. You try. Fine, Let's okay, see what I'll you do. It. I'll do it. You're going to go 69 right here. 127 miles per hour. You can check out your serve speed on Swing Vision 2. Dot, we got an issue.